Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to uh, Hampstead SDA Church here on Zoom. Uh, once again, my name is Steve Nelson, and I am your worship leader for today. In Psalms 100, it says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that had made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastors. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to our um, church here at Hampstead. If you are visiting with us, uh, whether you are a regular visitor or first time visitor, I want to thank you for your presence. And I pray and hope that you would have received a blessing as you give a blessing today as we worship together. Let us uh, have a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, heaven, once again, we want to thank you for your love towards us. We want to thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercies. We want to thank you, dear Lord, that you have kept us thus far and has brought us here once again to lift up your name, to worship you, to bring honor and glory unto your name. Dear Lord, as we come together once again, please
Dev? Yes, everyone could hear me? Yeah, let, let's pray, please. The mighty and precious divine Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. We thank you so much for this week. You have prepared for us and you have protected us. Continue to bless us day by day and help us that we can draw closer to thee. We thank you so much for our life and the blessing with him. And I also pray for the Brother Moore's family, a man full of knowledge. And I pray that once we die in Christ, we will be risen in Christ. But let this be something for us who are alive that we can achieve day by day by getting the victory over sin. That when Jesus uh, arrives in the clouds and gl with glory, that we will be all be raised and meeting him in the air. So help us that we will not have fear, but prepare ourselves, our homes, our family, that others will see Christ in us day by day. Continue to help us to be perfect and be with the proceeding today be with the speaker, that the message that will be presented will be a message that will draw us closer to Christ. Because the things around the world are happening so, so fast, and we need to be ready because Christ is returning. So bless us today on your Holy Sabbath day. May we respect and may we honor and understand the importance of the Sabbath day. So be with us now and keep us safe. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. Amen.
would like showers of blessing over them today. Raise your hand. Amen. The Miracle of Mercy, Peter. This is Peter. Hey, Whoop. Peter was a fisherman who was called by Jesus. Hey. Peter saw the many miracles of Jesus and he heard all of his teachings. When the time came for Jesus to die and take away the sins of all the world, Jesus had one final meal with his friends. During this meal, Jesus told his followers that the time had come for him to leave them. Huh? Peter asked, where are you going? Jesus told him Peter couldn't follow him now. What? But that he would follow him later. What is okay? But Peter said, why can't I come now? I'm ready to die for you. Jesus said, die for me. Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even knew me. Then Jesus and his disciples went to the Mount of Olives so Jesus could pray. Along the way, Jesus told his followers that they would all abandon him. Uh -oh. But Peter said, even if everyone else leaves you, I never will. Jesus said, Peter, 
this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. But Peter wouldn't believe it and vowed that he would stay with Jesus until the very end. The other disciples vowed the same. Yeah, I hear. Later on that night, Jesus was arrested by men sent by the religious teachers and priests. Peter tried to fight for Jesus, and he cut off the ear of one of the guards. But Jesus healed the guard and went quietly with the captors. All the disciples scattered just as Jesus told them they would. The men led Jesus away to the house of the high priest. Peter and another disciple followed them. Peter came to warm himself by their fire. Uh, hello. <clears throat> A servant girl noticed him in the firelight. Uh -huh. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. Oh, my. But Peter denied it for the first time. He said, I don't even know him. <sighs> After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. Oh. Peter for a second time said, no, I'm not. Uh, okay. <sighs> About an hour later, a man who knew the man whose ear Peter cut off said, Didn't I see you in the olive grove with Jesus? This must be one of them. He comes from the same place as all of them. Yeah, you're right. But Peter said, No, no, no. I don't know what you're talking about. And then Peter heard the crow of the rooster. Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Jesus' words flashed through his mind, and Peter left the courtyard weeping. Then Jesus died and was placed in a tomb. The disciples heard that he had come back from the dead. Peter even saw the empty tomb and believed that Jesus was alive again. And Jesus appeared to the disciples to show him that he was alive. Some of Jesus' followers were together when Peter said, I am going fishing. Okay. So they all went out to the sea, but caught nothing all night. At dawn, they saw a man standing on the beach. Oh, hey, over here. The man called out to them and said, Have you caught any fish? Nope. The man said, Throw out your net on the right side and you'll get some. Uh, okay. So they did, and they couldn't bring in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then one of the men on the boat said to Peter, It's Jesus! When Peter heard that it was Jesus, he swam to the shore while the others pulled in the load to the boat. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Mmm, -hmm, I miss a fish. Got it! Jesus said, Come have some breakfast. While they were eating, Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? Peter said, Yes, you know I love you. So Jesus said, Then feed my lambs. Then Jesus asked again, Do you love me? Peter said again, Yes, you know I love you. And Jesus said, Then take care of my sheep. And then a third time, Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time, so he said, You know everything. You know that I love you. So Jesus said one last time, Then feed my sheep. And so Peter went on to feed Jesus' sheep by helping establish the church and by writing books that we can now read in the Bible. And though he denied Jesus, he was forgiven and many came to know the love and forgiveness of Jesus through Peter. Pastor Pavel and Valentina decided to put God first, even through their struggles. What can we learn from their story today that will help us put God first in our own lives? 
Pastor Pavel and Valentina were responsible to serve a house church that required them to go over a scary trek of nine miles to get there. This risky trip made them tired and hungry, but it was impossible to find bread on store shelves in Sukumi, capital of Georgia's breakaway region of Abkhazia. It was 1993 during an armed conflict between Georgian and Abkhaz forces that resulted in a major food shortage. There were few bakeries selling bread at night, but they were always sold out every time Valentina dared to make the risky trip. One day after the worship service, Maya, a church member, offered Valentina some bread, but she refused to accept it. Maya, with a generous heart, insisted and cried. So Valentina divided the loaf into two, half for her and half for Maya. Valentina and her husband were happy since they had not eaten bread for over six months. She was thinking of eating it with barley soup. On their way back home, they met an old, thin, and filthy woman begging for food, saying she was starving to death. Valentina remembered the joy Maya had experienced when she had shared the bread with her. Would they have the courage to share their blessing as well, even in such a difficult situation? Valentina then opened her bag and shared the half loaf they had, and the old lady accepted in tears of joy. Valentina and Pavel continued on their way home with a joyful smile on their faces. This small and unique experience was greater than their hunger. Sometimes putting God first involves sharing what you have with others, even when resources are hard to come by. Pastor Pavel and Valentina put God first despite the sacrifice. Their courage inspires us today. Jesus gave up everything to redeem us, and His love compels us to put His kingdom first in our own lives. As we return the tithe and our promise offering, we are challenged to put God first. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's time for us to return our tithes and offerings. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter three and verse nine says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Let us pray. Almighty Father God, we your children thank you once again for allowing us to be in your presence. We praise you, Lord, for you are a most loving God and you are perfect in your ways, an example of generosity through the sacrifice of your son on Calvary. Today, you are not asking for us to sacrifice our children on a cross, but simply to offer your, our tithes and offerings through financial gain as is our duty to you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to give back to you as you have given to us without murmur. Please accept what we offer today. In Jesus' name, sake we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from John 21, verse 15 to 19. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than thee? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, 
when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee, whether thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. I want to thank everyone who has taken part into today's service thus far. And um, I pray and hope that as we continue to worship, the Spirit of the Lord will continue to be with us. It is now my privilege to introduce to you uh, today's speaker. Today's speaker is Pastor Richard Jackson. And he uh, comes to us from the North England Conference. Now, Pastor Jackson has um, preached at Hampstead before, and he has also spoken to us on um, our Wednesday night meeting. So he is no stranger to us or to our pulpit. And um, today he is here to do the work of God. And Pastor Jackson is um, a man who loves the word of God and he does not um, really um, want any long elaborated uh, introduction, except that he says that he has, is a married man and has two children and someone who wants to do the work of the Lord. Today, Pastor Jackson' um, uh, sermon title is um, entitled "Fisherman and a Mission." And as he speaks to us, I want to take this uh, opportunity to welcome him. And I pray that as you speak to us, Pastor, that um, the Holy Spirit may come and fill you, and that we would have received a blessing. Uh, but before Pastor Jackson speak to us, we will be favored with a special item entitled How Cheering is the Christian Hope. After which, the next voice you hear will be that of Pastor Richard Jackson. Thank you very much and be blessed.
Let me say good, good morning. Just afternoon, four minutes past the hour of 12. It's a privilege and a pleasure for me to join you here at Hampstead, Southern Adventist Church. And as Steve had said, I'm no stranger to Hampstead. I've preached several times since Pastor Steve McKenzie became pastor of your church. And I've been there ever since. And um, I want to thank Pastor Kevin Johns for the invitation to join you and to speak with you today as God's people. Surely the Lord has been good to us and respective we are experiencing this pandemic we can still trust God and we can still praise him irrespective of who we are. And I want to, 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 to thank the worship leader Steve and all those who have put the service together. Sister Ruth, it's good to see you. Um, I just want to say that God has been so good and gracious to us as a people. We have seen the challenge that we are facing, the challenge that will come. However, we are confident that God will see us through. Uh, I want us to, to focus today on a very simple topic, but a pretty important one. Because especially in this last days, the, the church seemed to be drifting and doing all different other things except what God has called us and commissioned us to do. And so the book of John chapter 21, let us turn there, the book of John chapter 21, which was ably read by our young preacher, I believe, prophetic, well-read. The Bible says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lamb. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, Son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter, he was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Let us pray, Heavenly Father. These words can only be spoken when you speak them. I am but undone, unclean, unholy. But because of your precious blood, because of who you are, you said that when we call upon you, you will answer us. And so, Lord, I pray even now that you will touch my mind, touch my brain, and allow me to 
speak these words with clarity, understanding, and that all of us as a people online will hear and will listen and will understand your words. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Over and over, the Bible inquires Christian pastors to feed the sheep. And three times in John chapter 21 and verses 15 through the 17, <clears throat> Jesus instructs Simon Peter, feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Feed my lambs. It was to the shepherds on the hillside that the heavenly angels first appeared in glory to announce the birth of Jesus. God handpicked David, the son of Jesse. And we have Jesse Samuels there too. A lowly shepherd boy to be the leader of his people. And that's the kind of leaders God wants. Obviously, shepherds make great leaders. And during Jesus' ministry here on earth, he was a shepherd. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, the Bible says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is here speaking. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd, which is Jesus, has laid down his life for you and for me. What do you say? I say, thank you, Jesus. Because of all of that, I am grateful to God that he has laid down his life. And if it was only for you, put your name inside there. If it was only for Steve or for Sarah or for Ruth, you, you put your name there, Jesse. Joan, you put your name there, Richard. You put your name there. If it was only for you, he would have died. And I say, thanks be to God. Again, he said in verse 14 of John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. What do you say? So Jesus was a shepherd. Now, Jesus did not refer to himself as the good fisherman, but as the good shepherd. So why didn't he chose shepherds as the future leaders of his church, just like what God did in the Old Testament. The question is, why fishermen and not shepherds? And I want you to follow me as I lay the foundation for this message. Why fishermen and not shepherds? You see, many of the great leaders of God's church in the Old Testament were shepherds. Are you hearing me? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses were all good shepherds. And all of them were entrusted with leading the people of God before Jesus came. The Eastern shepherd was the embodiment of courageousness and, and dedication. They fearlessly cared for the flock of God that was entrusted into their care and keeping. Flocks of sheep became numerous and healthy under the tutelage of many a faithful, hardworking shepherd. They cared for the new lambs and protected the growing flock from danger and from predators. How curiously then, for Jesus not to assign his New Testament church with shepherds. And I have a few reasons why he 
did not do that. First, he wanted to fulfill the prophecy. What prophecy, Pastor Jackson, are you talking about? Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah chapter 16. The book of Jeremiah chapter 16 and verse 16. Maybe we, we, we just didn't know that these verses were in the Bible. The book of Jeremiah chapter 16 and verse 16. The Bible says, but now I will send for many fishermen, declare the Lord, and they will catch them. And again, if you turn to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 47, Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse 10, Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse 10, it says that fishermen will stand along the shore. The fish will be of many kinds, like the sand of the great sea. So that's the first reason. The first reason, the first reason is that to fulfill prophecy, Jesus had every intention to remove from shepherds to fishermen into the New Testament. The second point that I want to make is for church growth. Why fishermen and not shepherd? You see, a shepherd is usually given an existing flock and maintains that flock in good fashion. But a fisherman by nature is more aggressive than a shepherd. He must go out to catch new fish every day. And for those of us who grew up in the fishing industry or in the fishing world, you see how if you're from the Caribbean or wherever you see fishermen, you know they go out literally every day to catch new fish. The new, the new church, however, must grow and grow fast. Fishermen could best perform that job description Peter, James, and John were all fishermen, and they were the closest to Jesus of the 12. Fishermen must work hard in all kinds of weather, or they will starve. The fishermen who avoids rainy days or stays at home when the forecast is borderline will soon be bankrupt. This enterprising nature of the fishermen was needed to accelerate the growth of the Christian church. And so notice that Jesus, he called fishermen. Number three, point number three, involvement. You see, I, 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 I think that Jesus chose fishermen because God needs many fishers and few shepherds. <laughs> I repeat that. Uh, you see, Jesus, uh, he, he needs many fishers and few shepherds. You see, in the Christian church, every member, like the disciples, is called to be a fisherman. But as you know in the church, how many of us, whether we are fishermen or fisherwomen, how many of us really take the time to do mission? But many of us, we take the time to criticize each other. Many of us, we take the time to, to, to involve in, in, in matters that are not pertinent to us. Many of us, we take the time to do all manner of things except be fishers of men and women. So as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 18 and 19, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishers. Come, and follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And I say, thank you, Jesus. 
You see, every Christian should be an evangelist. Every Christian should be a fisherman or fisherwoman. We are to be fishers of men, a missionary fishing for unsaved men and women, what you say, unsaved boys and saved girls. Jesus wants each and every one of us to be involved. But notice that the General Conference, they have what we call total membership involvement. Each of us need to be involved. Not everyone can be a shepherd. Hallelujah. But every one of us can be a fisherman, what do you say? Every one of us can be a fisherwoman. Not every one of us can be a shepherd. You see, Peter was a fisherman first. And only later did Jesus tell him that he could be a shepherd. And we, but irrespective of being a shepherd, we should never cease to be a fisherman. And so even myself being a pastor, a shepherd, I do not cease to be a fisherman. Every year, by God's grace, I try in his power to do some form of evangelism. It has got to be that this is the foremost reason why God has called me into ministry. And all of us, when he allow us to be his people, to be his servant, he calls us for service, not to sit idly, but to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. And so too many Christians are no longer fishers of men, but we are keepers of the aquarium, says one writer, Paul Harvey. He says, too many of us as Christians, we are no longer fishers of men, but we are keepers of the aquarium. That's deep and profound. Many of us, we just come to church to look on others and to criticize others and to, 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 to say, oh, this is not right. And don't get me wrong, we ought to do things in the best and correct way. But may I say this, that too many times we spend so many times in meetings, try to fix this, try to fix that. When all God is asking us to do is to be a servant to the people on the outside. Uh, I mean, Hampstead, surely I have come there most recently and I've seen how you have set up in serving the community. And this is what God wants us to do. We need to serve the community. And sometimes we just need to shut the church up and go out and tell others about the goodness of Jesus. They want to know many will not come to Hampstead Church, but all of us, can go out to tell the good news of Jesus. We must go out and tell others about Jesus. You see, our job is not to be aquarium keepers, but our job is to go out and fish for men. Our church must never forget its mission. You see, our mission is fishing for men and women, boys and girls. It is not a special activity for special people at special occasions, but the normal activity of every Christian every day. And so you can only imagine that if all of us do what we ought to do, we, did, we don't need a personal ministries director. We don't need a personal ministries department because all of us need to tell about the goodness of Jesus. Well, you know what happened? All of us are sitting waiting on everybody else to do except me. May I say that shepherds often live in isolation, but fishermen are not hermits. You see, fishermen are social people that mingle with people. You know, when you go to the 
to the to, to the seashore when the boat comes in, you'll see a number of people around the boat, around the fishermen. They are social people and they mingle with people. It takes a team of spiritual strong men to catch fish with large nets. Are you hearing me? It takes a, 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 a team of spirited strong men to catch fish with large nets. If he does not learn to work with others, he will not be successful. You see, the successful uh, fisherman must deal with both men. He must compete with many others in the fish market. He is not a loner. Jesus never upheld before us the life of the monastic lifestyle, meaning the way of life characteristics of monks or nuns in which they withdraw entirely are in part from society to devote themselves to prior solitude and contemplation. No, we are not called to be secluded from the world, but we are called to go into the world. He says, go out and make disciples of men and women, boys and girls. And so in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20, Jesus will go with you. Do you, do, do, do you not believe that? He will go with you. He said, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. I want us to know. And then he says, teach them, baptize them, let them learn of me and makes them, make them into disciples. You see, you are not to be alone. Fellowship is Jesus' way. Jesus wants us to be, to fellowship one with another. That former monk, Martin Luther said, more and greater sins are committed when men are alone than when they keep themselves in fellowship. And it was only when Adam and Eve were alone, away from God, could Satan deceive her. Only when King David was alone and idle did he fall into adultery. And so that's why the church, God puts the church together so that we could fellowship, so that we could work together. Why is it so difficult for us to work together? Why is it so hard for us to even find people to work in the church? Is always the same very few over and over again. But I want us to know, finally, that Jesus wants you and I to be a fisherman, what do you say? So whether your occupation is sitting at the desk or driving a truck or doing surgery or whatever it is, the same call that Jesus called Andrew with is also meant for you and for me. What do you say? You're not called to sit idle but to roll up your sleeves and be involved in outreach. You and I are called to be missionary, to go in global evangelism, to work in building up the cause of Jesus. A Christian who does not evangelize will eventually fossilize because we have got to be out doing something for Jesus, not just squabbling over ourselves, but we should be leading somebody to Jesus this year. The year is not yet over. COVID-19 have allowed us to start doing things differently. Reach out to somebody. I don't know, I will say this to you, that if it wasn't for COVID-19, uh, I wouldn't have known my neighbors so well. We've just moved here uh, over three years now. And since when COVID-19 came, my wife decided that 
let us go and look for these senior members on, on, on our street. Not members of the church. I'm talking uh, senior people on our street. And she said, I, 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 Richard, I want you to come with me. And she took my card. She took um, literatures. And let me say this, that every home had opened to us. As we walk down the street, knock each door, social distance, explain who we were, although they knew who we were even before we say who we were. You know, they do their research on us before we came in, you know that. But it was good that they opened their doors to us. And even right now, we are such good neighbors. Thank you, Jesus. Why? Because he makes the provision. And when he makes the provision and, and create the opportunity, all of us must take that opportunity. And so I want us to know that unfortunately, many of us are very sterile. By that I mean to say, we will never reproduce ourselves. You see, when God has clearly commanded us to make disciples, not just decisions. I repeat that. <laughs> I don't want you, you to, to leave here not understanding this. Uh, many of us as Christians, we are complacent. We are sterile. By that I mean, we, we, we don't reproduce ourselves. And when God has clearly commanded us to make disciples, how do we make disciples? We are reproducing ourselves, not just decisions. Consider this, that the total offspring of a single pair of flies, if they survive to the end of summer, would create a mound big enough to cover Texas to a depth of several feet because they are reproducing and reproducing and reproducing and reproducing. Even when you go into agriculture and when you plant one corn grain, it reproduces a large corn with maybe a couple of hundred grains. That's reproduction. You and I need to start reproducing what you say. You see the 12 disciples, they had to act quickly and with great zeal. Again, time is short. The end of the world is looping upon us. It seems to be only a matter of time before several um, nations acquire the atomic bomb and we are going to see some bomb goes off sometime in the near future. It's only a few more years of affordable oil remains for our use until modern life, as we know, is grinds down into anarchy. That's why you notice they're moving to electric beakers now. Because all your time, only when God's people rise up and follow their ultimate job description to be a fisherman, will they be doing the full will of God? Will you and I be doing the full will of God? Our ultimate task is not to warm a pew, although the disciples did often sit at Jesus' feet. There is nothing wrong in sitting at Jesus' feet, but our job is to become fishers of men and women, boys and girls. Shepherds care for the sheep. Fishermen are hunters. And that's why Jesus called fishermen. So what was God's first plan, actually? What was his first plan? Evangelism is God's third choice. For many of us, we believe that evangelism is God's first choice. No, evangelism is God's third choice. It is not the first choice. You see, the great gospel commission of going and telling is number three. God's second choice was for interested people to desire to come and see. 
You see, God hoped that his chosen people, Israel, would be so blessed because of their relationship with him that people would beat a path to their door. Then they could observe what can happen when people live life according to God's will. But his people, Israel, did not follow God very well. And so it didn't work. What was God's first choice? You want to know? I'm glad you ask. For 100% of humanity to have an unbroken relationship with him so that no one would have to seek the lost. You don't hear me today. You see, Adam and Eve spoiled God's highest hope. And now the church is operating under the mode of evangelism. It is wonderful, but it is God's third choice. The mission of every church is to uplift Jesus to the world, what you say. Your street is part of that world. So is every part of the North England Conference. So is every part of the, S of the South England Conference. So is every part of the British Union. I, I want you to know, so is your sons. So is your daughters. So when you go to your office on the playing field, in the, the shop, in the barber shop, when you go, wherever you go, they are part of your world. And so John chapter 17 and verse 18 says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. That's his disciples and that's us, what you say. Our job description is to go to the world just as Jesus went to the world and tell the world about Jesus. Go out and tell the world about Jesus. We are living in the last days. We must be faithful to our task. Did you know that Christianity could be just one generation away from extinction? Each generation must tell the next. If we would stop telling the world about Jesus, if we would stop preaching Jesus, burn all the Bibles, then Christianity could be over. But in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 47, the Bible says, the kingdom of heaven, hallelujah, is like a fishing net. We are the fishermen. A lot of people are not good fishermen. And I have noticed that many times, even though people are not fishermen. What we need to do, we need to learn how to be fishers of men. What do you say? We cannot sit down and say, I can't do this. We cannot sit down and say, I can't do that. We are here to train and to teach each other how to fish. And so as an illustration, one day a rich man he went fishing. He had all the latest and finest equipment. And hours later, he caught nothing. He walked on up the river and came upon a small boy with a stick and a bent hook. The boy had a fine string of trout over his shoulder and he was about to go home. The man, he questioned the little boy, how did you get so many fish? And I got nothing and we were both using the same bait. The little boy said to the man with all the fancy and the latest equipment, you have got to keep yourself out of sight. And so I'm saying to us today, the church is so confused about evangelism. The church is so confused about mission. You see, our role in mission is to sow the seed. Sow precious seed, Psalm 126 says. And when we sow that seed, <clears throat> it's not our business 
to save anybody. We can't save anybody. And that's the mistake that the church is making. We want to save people. No, the harvest belongs to God. It is the Holy Spirit that directs us to people. So the seed, do that which God has called you to do. So if he called you to your neighbor to give them some food and clothing, to visit in prison, to provide a help here and there, to give the Bible study, that's what he calls you to do. The harvesting of souls belong only to God. And so many of us, what we do, we don't keep ourselves out of sight. We present ourselves as we are the God. We present ourselves as we are, as if we are in charge. But to be a success, successful fisher of men, we must preach Jesus, talk Jesus, and get him into sight, and get ourselves out of sight. Send the people away talking about Jesus instead of praising you and praising me. Send them talking about the goodness of Jesus. Tell them what Jesus has done for you, for all the accomplishment that we have is not about us. It's about Jesus. Don't impress them with our fancy homes, with our fancy cars, with our fancy clothes, but let us impress them about Jesus, what you say. And so Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So go, go somewhere. Hampstead, find somewhere this week. Find someone this week. Find some place this week. And let us tell the goodness of Jesus. I want you to know that COVID-19 is not here for just people dying. COVID-19 is here for us to tell the world that this problem of COVID-19 can only be fixed by Jesus. Do you notice that no man can understand it? Do you notice that they, every is just trial and error? This is all about our God. This is an opportunity for us to, to tell the world that Jesus is coming soon. Do you know one of the greatest impediment of, successes, of, of successful fishing is? It is the poverty of our personal relationship with Jesus. That's why we don't experience him. We are not truly converted. If we are truly converted, we will not sit in bed when we ought to go out to tell others. If we are truly converted, we won't wait on the church to call for evangelistic meeting. If we are truly converted, we won't wait on the personal ministers department to mark the card to say how many people did we feed this week? No, when we are truly converted and when we are really called to be fishers of men, we will just go out and do that which Jesus has called us to do. That's why we don't catch fish. The reason we don't know the fisherman. So if we know Jesus, then we show Jesus or demonstrate Jesus then you and I will be successful in the mission of God's church. Not our mission, but the mission of Jesus Christ.
And so today, I trust the Lord will bless us. The Lord will keep us. The Lord will guide us. And today, the appeal is today, are we ready to be fishermen and fishwomen for Jesus? Not shepherds, but fishers of men. If that's your desire today, to say to the Lord, Lord, my desire is to be fishers of men. My desire is to get up from off my seat and go out to tell about the goodness of Jesus. If that's your desire, then I just want you to put it in the chat. Place it in the chat. Is that your desire today? Uh, it is my desire. The preacher's desire is to continue to be a fisherman for Jesus. Is that your desire today? Then place it in the chat. Say, Lord, I want to be a fisherman. I want to be a fisherwoman. I want to be a fisher boy. I want to be a fisher girl. Each of us are called. Is that your desire? Then you place, yes, Lord. Or you write it all out. I want to be a fisherman for Jesus. Place it in the chat. I'll give you a few moments to do that today. Only there and then, Matthew 24 and verse 14 will say, and this gospel of the kingdom must be preached into all the world as a witness to every nation. And then the end will come. Do you want to be a part of the saving of souls? Notice what I said, apart, because God requires us to be his hands. He requires us to be his feet. But may I say to you, do not let anybody stop you from doing what God calls you to do. Let us pray, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your words today. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for blessing us. And thank you for allowing us to be committed and to make this commitment to be fishers of men. Bless us. Keep us, guide your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. I want to thank you, Pastor Jackson, for that very lovely, um, heartfelt, soul-searching sermon in reminding us to become our ultimate, uh, to fulfill our ultimate calling in becoming the fisherman that we are supposed to become. To sow the seed and tell the world that Jesus is coming again. I was truly blessed and um, reminded of the work that I have to do and I pray and hope that uh, everyone under the influence of your voice have felt that calling and have taken it uh, seriously and want to become uh, a fisherman for God. I want to take this opportunity also to thank uh, Dave for his lovely prayer and to thank Sarah also for the prayer, for the offerings, and thank Adriana for so beautifully reading our scripture reading. At this time, we are um, going to have our 
closing hymn, which is entitled He Lead at Me, after which, Pastor, I will ask you to come back and do the closing prayer for us. Thank you very much and God bless. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for moving us thus far into this service. We want to thank you for your words again. Pray that you will be with us as we end this service. May you bless us in a very special and real way. And help us to move forward into your grace and into your love by growing daily into your words, by doing that which you have commissioned us to do. We thank you, Lord, for your blessing again. And ask that as we separate one from another, that your spirit will be with us and continue to bless us in all that we do. And now we say the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and even forevermore. Amen.